Dear learners and listeners, Namaskar. I am Dr. Shweta and I am back again with the second part on going beyond the reality, thinking and reasoning. Before we move on, I should tell you that what we did in the last program. We talked about the nature and the components of thinking. We also talked about the problem solving and various stages in problem solving. Today in our discussion, we are going to talk about the mental set that is there in problem solving. We will also be explaining the different types of reasoning as well as we would be talking about the relationship between language and thought. Let us begin with the first objective of today's program which is mental set in problem solving. Before we move further, we should know that what is mental set. Have you ever realized that you have a tendency of solving the new problem in the old ways? That means we have a mental set of looking at the novel problem and finding the solution to the new problem in the old manner. Say for example, you are asked to move this pen without using your hands and fingers. What would you do? So, the best option is to move it with a blow of air. But sometimes we are stuck on finding solutions to such problems. Mental Z is something that hinders our problem solving. That is, the problem solving becomes difficult because we are looking at the new problem and we are trying to find out the solution based on our past experiences. Mental set hinders our problem solving because it restricts our cognitive process of looking around things in the novel way. It results in mental rigidity. What is mental rigidity? As the name suggests, we have a set mental state of mind to find solutions to new problems based on our past experiences. And this results in the inflexible or this results in the rigidity of our mind to look at the novel problems from a new point of view. This also affects the creativity. But it has often been found that mental set can also enhance the quality and speed of perceiving a problem solving. Why does it happen? As we all know that experience matters. That means whenever we are experienced with something, then it becomes easy for us to process the information and find out solutions to the problem. Say for example, in the last program, we discussed that if we are shifting to a new place and we are changing the setting of our room, how we are going to move the table from one place to another. That means if we are already having experience of doing the same thing, then it becomes easy for us to perform certain tasks based on our past experiences. That means in such cases, mental set enhances the quality and speed of perceiving and problem solving. But it has been found that under certain circumstances and conditions, it can also restrict as well as inhibit the quality of our mental activity or thinking. Why does it do so? Because we are lingering on the same old tendency to look at the novel problems in the same old way. Say for example, you are asked to perform an algebra problem, maths algebra problem in the class. You might have done the same problem in some previous class. So what is going to happen that you are not going to look at the statement properly or you are going to find solution to the new problem in the old manner only. That means in certain circumstances, this mental set is restricting the quality of the cognitive ability. So this is all about mental set and how does it inhibits creativity and our problem solving. Let us come up to the next topic of discussion which is reasoning and decision making. Now let us understand first that what is reasoning. As we all know and the name suggests, reasoning is a mental process 
that means in order to reason or in order to give reasons to particular things you need to think over it that means the cognitive functions are at work reasoning is involved in a number of processes for example it is involved in logical thinking it is involved in problem solving and decision making so when we talk of reasoning reasoning is information from the environment and the stored information in the brain are used to arrive at certain conclusion that means what we have already stored and what is in front of us is actually helping us to reason out and to find solutions that is reasoning now there are two types of reasoning one is known as deductive reasoning and another is known as inductive reasoning let us know about deductive reasoning first when we are talking about deductive reasoning what happens that the person in deductive reasoning tries to deduce or draw conclusions from a set of initial assertions or premises for example if this situation is in front of you that all a are b it is a premise another is all b are c again a premise therefore it results in all a are c that is if a is equals to b and b is equals to c that means it ultimately means that a is equals to c that means things are given to you it is in front of you what you are supposed to do you have to deduce the problem from what is given to you another kind of reasoning is known as inductive reasoning what is inductive reasoning in comparison to deduction reasoning the process in inductive reasoning is reversed why it is reversed that is we go from available evidence to generate a conclusion about the likelihood of something do you remember what was happening in the deductive reasoning deductive reasoning is everything was in front of you and you were deducing something out of it but what is happening in inductive reasoning in inductive reasoning you have certain set of information and from that information you have to come to a conclusion let me make inductive reasoning more clear to you with this example suppose you are not able to locate your scooter keys in your house what you are going to do you try to look at a place where you generally keep your keys you do not find them there what happens is that you use inductive reasoning in this case that is you do a mental search how do you do it for example you might think that i took out the scooter keys and with another key i opened the entrance door and at as i entered the house immediately the telephone bell was ringing so i proceeded to pick up the phone call i had to note down a message i took out the pen from my pocket and noted down the telephone number on the telephone diary i must have kept the keys over there you proceed there to search the keys and find them so what was happening in inductive reasoning that every information was available to us to you you were doing a mental search to find the solution to the problem that is you had the car keys you opened the front door you received the telephone car you took out pen to note down that means you were doing a mental search and this mental search that is the information which was available in your memory helped you to find out that you might have kept the keys on the telephone table so this is inductive reasoning where the available information helps us in finding the solution to the problem let us move on to the next topic of discussion which is decision making now what is decision making as we all know in everyday life we often make personal economic social and political decisions which could have far reaching consequences for example you may decide to take a physics as a subject of specialization in your studies you are making a decision which could have a far reaching consequence in your life we often make decisions of routine nature for example what to make in breakfast or what is going to be my career 
or what subject I'm going to choose that is going to decide my career. So we are actually making the decisions which have temporary consequences that is what I'm going to make for the breakfast in the morning as well as what subject I'm choosing that is helping me in finding a better career. For example, someone closely related to you has been hospitalized and the doctor is asking you that the surgery needs to be done. So are you going for the surgery that time only or will you take the second opinion? That means you are deciding on that whether to go for this or not to go for this. That means we are involved in number of decision making processes in our whole life. Decision making is often used with judgment. We should know that what is the difference between judgment and decision making. So when we talk about judgment and decision making, we should know that these are actually interrelated processes. What is happening in judgment and decision making? Let's uh, per se take judgment. What happens in judgment? Judgment involves evaluation of information about the world while decision requires choices. Let us make the distinction clear with the help of an example. The judge hears the argument and examines the evidences provided by the lawyers and on hearing the argument gives his judgment in this case. On the other hand, Decision making is a kind of problem solving in which quite a few alternatives are available and one has to make a choice. For example, how are you going to reach the airport with different routes? That means judgment is that listening to different things, different evidences, you are coming at a judgment and what is decision making which is actually involved in problem solving and those problem solving might relate to the routine tasks or to the bigger tasks in life. So this was all about judgment, decision making and problem solving. Let us come up to the last objective of today's program that is what is language and thought and how are they interrelated. So when we are talking about language and thought, the first thing that comes to our mind is that are they interrelated? Let us explain how they are related. Often people have wondered whether language is essential for thinking or not. Is it possible to think without language? Most of our thinking involves words. Well established that language and thought are related. If language is essential for thinking, then an obvious question that arises is what happens to those who cannot speak? For example, a child. Have you ever seen that how a child babbles when he or she has not developed language and how the child is able to communicate with his or her expressions? In the same manner, have you ever realized that how deaf people or those who cannot speak, how they communicate? They communicate through the sign language. So when we are talking about language and communication, there are two basic characteristics in language that is symbols and communication. That is in order to understand that how language is helping us to communicate, we should know that in language we are using certain symbols and those symbols are helping us to communicate. Now let us understand that what are symbols. In order to know what are symbols, symbols are the arbitrary concepts that we have attached to certain, to all the things around us. For example, home. So this symbol stands for home. This stands for classroom. This stands for office. This stands for temple. That means on looking at these slides, you should know that for certain things in the environment, we have given certain symbols. For example, in this slide, if a building looks like this, then the symbol given to this building is known as temple. In this picture, if you look at benches, blackboards, notice on the wall, that means the symbol given to such a situation is known as classroom or school. That is, how are we attaching? These buildings represent something that has a meaning more than what the building carries. Home is a place where a family lives. And school is a building 
where education is imparted to the children. When these words, that is school, home, etc., are associated with certain functions, they acquire meaning and we recognize those words and use them for communicating with others. That is, for example, when you tell another person that you are going to the temple, that is, you are communicating that you are going to a place or building for worship. As I have already made clear that how is language and communication happening? In order to language and communication to happen, we are assigning certain symbols to certain events and aspects in the environment and based on those symbols, we are communicating with the people around us. Language also helps us in describing abstract ideas or thoughts in addition to the concrete objects or everyday use and experience. We had already discussed about the abstract and concrete concepts in the previous program. So, what are abstract ideas? As we all know that through language, we are able to express our abstract thought. For example, the abstract thought is the judgment. So, whenever this word comes to your mind, then what happens? The picture of judgment is shown like this. You cannot touch this concept. but you, this is an abstract concept, you have to understand it and we, as we have already discussed that we understand such abstract concepts through our experiences with these concepts. Often people have wondered whether language is essential for thinking or not. That is, do you think that thinking is possible without language? Most of our thinking does involve words. Watson called thinking as inner speech. If language is essential for thinking, then an obvious question that arises is that what happens to those in whom there is no language or people whose language is not yet developed? It has been argued that such people can use sign language to communicate their thought. That means that in order to communicate, we can communicate through our sign language also. That is, we have already discussed that how those people like the young children or infant communicate with the people in the environment around them. That is, they are communicating through their sign language. So, this was all about today's program in which we talked about the mental set in problem solving. We also discussed about decision making and judgment, different types of reasoning and language and thought. But before I end up for today's program, let us understand that what we have understood in the part 1 and part 2 of this lesson. Initially, in part 1, we talked about that thinking is a mental or cognitive process that often starts with a problem situation. That is, whenever you have a problem, you have to think about it. This is how thinking is evolved. Thinking involves many types of mental structures such as the concepts, schemas and mental imaging. So, what are concepts? The concepts are the class names based on the categorization. We had also talked about the another component of thought which is schema. What is schema? The schema refers to a mental structure that consists of several concepts and imagery. We also in the first part talked about problem solving and the various stages in problem solving. In today's program, we discussed about mental set that is developed by a person and that may create rigidity and obstacles in problem solving. We also talked in today's program about mental set that hinders problem solving, the two types of reasoning and the relationship between language and thought. So, this was all about today's program. I hope that I have made the concepts clear to you. Thank you.